Electronic media that have the ability to arouse emotions so powerfully that they can cause someone who has already been paranoid, depressed, a loner, blaming other people for all the problems in his life, mm -hmm. say to himself, yeah, that guy's just like me. I'm going to do it, and I'm going to kill more than he did. People are going to remember who I am. Now, of the 10 people watching the coverage who felt that way, only one of them will do it tomorrow. But that's one more than would have happened had there not been that coverage. All right, well, let me ask you also about the, what role the media plays in all of this. Because you actually, and, it, and it's not been covered very much, and, but as I was looking through, there was a, a small report where you talked about, uh, it advised the media on how not to cover <laughs> a mass murder um, killing, and, or a mass murder in a situation such as Newtown. And you had a list of things that you told them, and it is absolutely contrary to everything they do, yeah. uh, and, or we do. And I, it's something, I mean, I think in the last mass murder, the last most horrific one, the Newtown one, where the children were um, murdered, there was an effort by some of, in the media not to mention the killer's name. And that's about as far as they went, and it sort of only lasted a couple of days. Then we got to see tons and tons of pictures of the news media just camping out. They interviewed everybody in that town from the street cleaner to and people that had no relationship to any of the victims, just anybody who was walking by that they could get in front of a microphone. And on your list you said, if you don't want to propagate more mass murders, saying that this kind of um, coverage could lead to more murders, I, I, I have to assume from that peg, don't start the story with sirens blaring, don't have photographs of the killer, don't make this a 24-7 coverage. These are all things that happen every single time. Do everything you can not to make the body count lead the story. That's totally how they led. It's how they lead initially, and it goes yeah. all the way to the funeral, especially with the children, which made you sick every time you heard the number, or made me sick. Um, not to make the killer some kind of anti-hero. I think they're doing less of that. Um, and do localize the story to the effective community. Um, they didn't do that. They say this is a small community, but it's like every other small community in America. Right. So they actually go out of their way to make, uh, at least in the coverage that I've seen, and it's true in all the coverage, they make that part of the story that it may be a small community you haven't heard of, but it's just like yours. Yep. <laughs> so it's coming to your neighborhood soon. So let me ask you, what has been the response to these? Um, and do you really think that the media coverage would instigates more murder? Yeah, I think on this particular kind of media coverage of mass murder, I think there are three untoward effects. The first is copycat mass murders, and that's the one you're asking. I'll describe it, but I don't want to miss the other two. The other two are that that kind of coverage traumatizes viewers. Now, I realize they subject themselves to the trauma, but they are actually harming their viewers. If we could measure psychological harm in the sa with the same kinds of measures that we current have for, say, secondhand smoke, that kind of coverage of a mass murder does more harm than a million smokers secondhand smoke. It does more harm than high sugar soft drinks in the city of New York. Um, I don't know if Bloomberg would agree, but I get your I point. I don't care what Bloomberg says about this or any other point, actually. The, um, the harmfulness has never been measured of uh, the psychological impact of ordinary news. The only thing in this country where it's been measured appropriately has been the 9-11 coverage. Uh, the coverage of 9-11 clearly did enormous psychological harm. Now, you could say that all of that is um, attributable to the criminals who committed the crime, or you can spread the blame between the criminals and the media who inflict the repetitive uh, video and the repetitive emotional arousal, or you can say that this is a kind of self-destructive act in which the viewer turns it on and watches and causes themselves symptoms. There are all different ways to argue about it, and as a society, we haven't figured this out. But make no mistake, people are harmed by watching this. Now, the third kind of harm is an altogether different one. 
it's that when there is such coverage of an event, whether it's Virginia Tech or Newtown, that is all the impetus politicians need to have, the press machine behind them, to pass stupid and ill-thought-out laws. Every time high publicity crimes drive a law, it's the wrong law. And this is um, something I've been watching my entire career, and it's one of the reasons that I try to stay clear of politicians. They're just trying to attach their name to whatever's in the news, and the actual outcome and the effects on the public and the well-being of the public are not their priority. They'll pretend it is, but that isn't true. I mean, don't you think, though, that after these events they talk about passing gun control laws, but they don't generally pass? Uh, and I'd say thankfully, because of the kind that they try to pass. Um, I think this time there may be some movement toward um, background checks of a kind that are feasible, but um, all sorts of ill-considered legislation has been proposed around this. Did you have something in mind that you think is, is fruitful like, for these mass kinds of shootings? Well, like, gun control would be the dumbest idea for protecting what is, what against mass shooting. Think, what do you think is, the, if you are steering clear of them because they're just trying to use that tragedy to get their name in the news and, and to pass this bad, leg, as you said, this ill, ill-conceived legislation, what do you think might be appropriate? Well, what are we trying to change? If, we're, if what we're trying to change is mass murder, I already know how to prevent mass murder, I can tell you that, and it's got nothing to do with the weapons. Um, if we're trying to prevent school violence, I can tell you what to do about that. We know how to do that too. If you're trying to prevent violence in America, well, we're already doing quite well at reducing it. So let's go to the first two. For mass murder? If you want to reduce mass murder, the most important thing to turn off is the copycat effect of the news. And um, the things you described earlier that I've been proposing for 20 years are precisely, I still believe, the right way to do it. Uh, local news stories that mention victim names, that give body counts, that talk about funerals, of course that local community has a legitimate need for some of that information. There is no reason on earth for people outside that county to know the names of the victims or to see the crying parents or to uh, hear all the details about the killer's biography. The effect of that extra unneeded information is uh, all the negative effects that I mentioned. Not just copycat, but also harm to viewers and also politicians going wild. So, um, and we know this to be true because of what happened with product tampering. In 1982, there was a criminal innovation of product tampering with cyanide put in Tylenol. It became the number two news story in history, second only to the Kennedy assassination, mm -hmm. and how many households were exposed to the information. By 1985, we had 3,500 tampering crimes a year. So an innovation that was marketed by the media produced 3,500 crimes a year at the peak. Now, not all those crimes were fatal. Many of them were hoaxes and threats, but they cost billions of dollars. I was in the center of this with, the, uh, with industry, helping them sort out the threats at that time. So I saw what they went through. Part of the way that that stopped was a wonderful set of conferences run by a now non-existent foundation that had uh, put together conferences of, the, uh, of industry, of law enforcement, and of journalists to look at this problem and what can we do about it. One of the recommendations that they came to by consensus in every one of these regional meetings was we're gonna localize the news. On the wire stories, instead of calling it international or national, it's going to be called local or regional. And immediately, the crimes dropped off. And now it's not even on anyone's radar about product tampering. So we can do this same thing with mass murder if we had the will and if the media had the will to stop killing people. I think they control this more than anyone. Now, within an organization, 
we also can prevent mass murder by doing what um, my company, Threat Assessment Group, has been training organizations to do for 20 years. For 26 years, we've been handling cases one at a time. For 20 years, we've taught people, how do you prevent this? And it requires a top-down approach for the organization so that there are people who know what to do when they learn of untoward behavior, so that everyone in the organization reports untoward behavior, and, uh, and it's quite simple, but voluminous. So if we wait till uh, a student or a coworker makes a threat to kill other people, now we have a high risk situation to manage. That can be done. We do it three times a day at my office, uh, with 100% success, by the way. But it's always high stakes. There's always a chance of one going wrong. Mm -hmm. There's always a chance people will be killed. Had, um, had the people who saw the signs that preceded the threat to kill reported what they saw, which is uh, typically bullying, harassment, insubordination, a host of ordinary management problems, those could have been managed in a, in a less expensive, less risky way to improve the performance of that employee or student, maybe keep them in school or on the job and not have to worry about violence. Maybe sever their relationship with the school or the workplace by terminating or expelling them. Um, do you see, and, if, wait, let me just ask you, then do you see any role for the media? I mean, what is the role of the media in these kinds of incidents? I mean, where, where can, what can they say? What should they be saying? I mean, because they're going to report it. I know they're telling them what not to say, but what it would be okay and wouldn't cause more of these kinds of crimes well, to happen? Well, first of all, I think it's easy for print media. Print media can do what they've always done. They can to give the extent, detail. the two guys that are left in print media. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> all right. Um, that was the way to have thoughtful, um, verified, complete sentence coverage with minimal emotional arousal. Only when they started using color pictures did they get into danger territory. It's the electronic media that have the ability to arouse emotions so powerfully that they can cause someone who has already been paranoid, depressed, a loner, blaming other people for all the problems in his life, mm -hmm say to himself, yeah, that guy's just like me. I'm going to do it, and I'm going to kill more than he did. People are going to remember who I am. Now, of the 10 people watching the coverage who felt that way, only one of them will do it tomorrow. But that's one more than would have happened had there not been that coverage. Because in every audience with these saturation level stories, there are millions of people who are paranoid, and there are millions of people who are depressed, and there are millions of people who are angry, and there are tens of thousands who are paranoid, depressed, and angry, and armed. And all it takes is 10 of them to identify with this guy and say, I'll do it tomorrow to get one who does. So it's interesting. Do you think um, that the focus then by uh, the media on gun control is to avoid having to focus on themselves? No, no, I think that they're carrying out an agenda that many people have. It's been part of what any of us with a liberal education were trained to think. And it, you know, it's parroting what is supposed to be part of the liberal agenda. But if you actually look at the data and what we know about effectiveness or lack of effectiveness of gun laws, it would not support that approach. Okay. Um, let me switch to a different subject. Something lighter, porn. Now, <laughs> <laughs> um, I wanted to ask you because you actually said something that's kind of interesting and uh, about uh, the role, um, and I, uh, well, I'll just ask you what role you think porn plays in creating violent offenders and what is the relationship between a violent film, um, a, a sexually violent, and, and sexual violence. Uh, and what, it, what, is, what has your study shown you of this issue? Yeah, well, because it's a little bit out there, I thought. I mean, a little bit different than uh, what I would have guessed. Um, 
Well, the one, one hazard, not to guess anything you're going to say for fear of usually being wrong. <laughs> you, can't, you can't predict it. <laughs> well, on, on, on porn, I, I've got a couple things to say. Um, one I've written, and it's part of the Attorney General's Commission on Pornography Report. Which is available, isn't it, to yes, the public? Yes, right. it People is. People can look that up. And, and there, it has to do with the health effects of the entire porn industry, which I think at the time I wrote that were very bad that there were a lot of uh, sad health effects. Now, you're asking me about a specific thing, violence. Yes. I, I don't think that Penthouse and Playboy have anything whatsoever to do with the violence. I don't think that nipples make people kill. <laughs> okay. Uh, um, I do um, think that there is a kind of um, erotic stimulus that poses some risks. And the kind of erotic stimulus that poses some risks is the kind that helps to teach people to um, merge their lustfulness with their cruelty. Now, we don't actually know, and this is a topic of a 10-hour lecture, we don't actually know what causes people to find cruel imagery arousing, except that some people learn some of that. In other words, we could ultimately know that there are genetic vulnerabilities or hormonal vulnerabilities to acquiring um, this, but there is no question that there are millions of people who can be turned on by pictures of coercive sex of a woman bound and so on. What we would not want to do is to popularize any kind of um, stimulating imagery that would encourage people to take sexy women and cut them up or kill them. Now, the sexy women part is what's typically called the pornography. The tie them up and kill them part is what can be on the networks. So, um, we've got it all wrong in how the rating systems are used and what's on network TV versus cable. It, we'd be far better off if we showed no violence on network TV and plenty of nipples, which seems to be happening on cable, though they still have even more violence. The, the issue is that the, and I, my wife's going to be mad if I don't say genitals, <laughs> male and female. <laughs> okay. So the, the, um, the problem is the merging of the two. So back during the Pornography Commission, I asked Jack Valente, who was very powerful in Hollywood, what would he think? Would he take back to the industry a simple proposition? The proposition was a cooling off period that every filmmaker would agree that we would have a one minute or three minute, we can negotiate, cooling off period between that part of the movie that will give 80% of the males an erection and the time that the women is tied up or slaughtered. Let's just not make it sexy to bind, torture, or slaughter women. Could we do that? He blew me off. That's all I was asking for there. And that comes from a, a lifetime of study. You, is, that, is that something that you um, asked for when you're a consultant? If you're consulting on, say, Kiss the Girls, or do you talk to the, um, I mean, on, on some of those movies yeah. that depict a murder, do you talk, and there's girls being bound up in that and, forced, and having, you know, being forced to have sex. Is that something that you would insist on if you're uh, helping to be a consultant? Um, Besides the realism of it? It depends on who I'm talking to. If I'm talking to someone who actually has control of that, I would try to push for it. But I don't get listened to about everything okay. I advise by the media or by producers. All right, producers. Well, I'm sorry, I interrupted you. Yeah. We were talking about, um, I, we were talking before. I think it's this Alfred Hitchcock formula from Psycho of turn on the man and then kill the woman that's the problem. I just want to separate those two. And that's because I know that some sexual sadists who commit vicious crimes acquired their taste for at least aspects of what they do to women from various media portrayals. Now, not always ones you'd label pornography. I wrote an article with a couple colleagues called Detective Magazines, 
pornography for the sexual sadist. What we found, and this was just from case studies, is that some sexual sadists acquired their taste looking at the covers of detective magazines, which had attractive women, typically wearing lingerie, who were tied up and being threatened by a man. And that was a very sexy image to sexual sadists, and they'd use that for masturbation in childhood. So, so isn't that a chicken or an egg, though? I mean, like, what came first? Well, it is, to some extent. But this article made the case well enough that that industry overnight changed so that from that point on, detective magazines had as their standard cover imagery, sexy woman with a gun, which was absolutely a step in the right direction. Now, uh, it's true that people seek out their pornography. They seek out their media. It's not random which teenagers pick violent video games or, or watch violent movies or will sneak to get violent things they shouldn't be looking at. Um, they choose that in part, and so that does create a big chicken and egg issue. The research on the effects of media on aggression, and typically they're not looking at anything that matters, they're looking at whether you'd hit a an inflatable clown balloon or something of that sort, mm -hmm. um, because it'd be unethical to do the real experiment, which would require showing thousands of sex offenders slasher films. No scientist could ever get that past an IRB, but Hollywood does it with every release. You see the problem here? Yeah. It'd be unethical to do such a thing. I just have problems with telling people what to do when they're creating art, based yeah. on the fact that a small percentage of their audience has a proclivity to read it a certain way. And, and that's that when you say it to me, my mind goes right there. Yes, because um, the concern is that government would try to tell them what to do, and government shouldn't. And I think that uh, whether any of us should wish they would do differently might depend on how big is the effect. Well, every time there's been a measurement of an effect size of media and aggression, there is an effect, but it's not very big. So how much aggression in society can be attributed to video games and, and movies and TV and so on is some, but not a whole lot. Then it becomes a matter of how much do we want to tolerate? How much obesity are we going to allow in the population before we regulate? How much um, freedom to uh, be titillated with violence do we want to allow before we regulate? Those are all policy decisions. I, I, and I have to go back to something that when we were talking about weapons and, and you were talking about mass murder, but I, I was curious because I left open a, another area which you totally could speak to, the issue of regulating um, uh, the sane versus the insane's access to guns, because a lot of times after this happens, I and mean, you do have people that are, are, are seriously mentally ill. I don't know if you would find them sane. Or, I mean, you'd have yeah. to do all your testing to go yeah. beyond that. But certainly what we find out in the news is that they're seriously mentally ill and that people yes. knew it, and they still had access to firearms. Bingo. So do you have something to, uh, some way that you think that should be regulated? Uh, I absolutely think that that deserves tremendous attention. It's a very big issue deserving of attention. Now, I'll tell you about the first study I ever did of this. I wish it had been done well enough that I had published it, but I just sent a bunch of my law students to, uh, on a field trip to the Hospital for the Criminally Insane, where I had them take the federal firearms form, the yellow form every gun buyer has to fill out, and ask the questions on there to men currently incarcerated because they had been adjudicated mentally ill and dangerous to self or others. And I had them ask the questions. And one of the questions is, have you ever been adjudicated mentally ill or dangerous to self or others? And all of the incarcerated mental patients said no. <laughs> <laughs> This isn't the way to screen for it. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm fine. Right. <laughs> well, it's just, it's, it's an interesting thing because um, it, it seems, yeah, I mean, it just seems also that once they are adjudicated mentally ill, then some states take away their firearms and some states don't. 
And to me, that seems like a really easy fix. I mean, where it just to err on the side of safety that you don't get that right back. I mean, there are other rights. We take a rate of felons right to hold uh, to own a gun we take away his right to vote i mean it seems like there could be some regulation once somebody is but is adjudicated to be mentally insane well i would say that's too high a standard okay. before we limit gun rights that's a very small percentage of the mentally ill who would ever meet that standard so what's and, the right one and that's where we have that's where we're going to have difficulty is finding the right standard and the right way to do it uh, having been committed to an institution or put on a 72-hour hold, maybe a lower standard that would be better. But even there, it's sort of random when someone's going to call the police or, or call the mental health system and get someone committed. Um, there are many, many mentally ill people who've never been picked up on a mental health hold or committed and who shouldn't have arms. But it, it brings us to another question, because it's not just the mentally ill. I mean, if I were the emperor, we would not allow firearms in the hands of people who um, were mentally ill, or drunkards, or drug addicts, um, or uh, who had um, no capacity for rational decision making for other reasons. But we wouldn't allow those people to vote either. What if we were to simultaneously strip some people of the rights to speech and voting and firearms? Could we ever agree on which criteria? Mm. Should someone be capable of voting but not capable of owning a gun? How could that be? Do we let the mentally ill vote but not own guns? I, I think we've got a lot of homework to do if we're going to take away rights guaranteed by the Bill of Rights from some of the population. And we're going to have a hard time reaching consensus on who should be permitted to vote and own guns. So this is a dangerous slope. For, I mean, there you go into the law as opposed to yeah. the mental health. Well, we have come to an hour. We actually went a bit long because it was so interesting. And I, I really wanted to, like you said, we could probably go on for days. There's so much to cover. I really appreciate hearing what you had to say. It was really interesting, and, and I appreciate you coming here because I, I learned a lot, and I know my audience learned a lot, and it just lets us step back and realize that it's not as simplistic as we think. And, and the way these stories, these really high-profile cases that you've been involved in have been covered bear very little resemblance to what actually happened. When I sit here and listen to you talk, I, I, my questions are based on what I read and what I've seen, and, and I'm off base a lot of the time. You know, Roger Edelman, who was the Hinckley prosecutor and who really taught me a great deal about how to go after finding the truth, told me before that trial began, have someone save the newspaper clippings for you, but don't read them during the trial. You don't want to be biased by the news and misled by the news. And what I found reading the stories afterward is that the news gave a story with the same names and dates and places but it was all wrong. And that's been true of every high profile event I've been around, and that's maybe 30 of them, that the news got names, dates, and places right, but not the real story. Well, it's a, it's a good lesson for the audience to realize and to view and something that we try to focus on in, in both of these shows, to look at the news and, from a very critical eye and wonder about different things that aren't substantiated correctly. I mean, and just wonder more about everything, be more critical. So Looking, thank you. It's yeah. terrific to look behind the news. I compliment you on doing it. Well, thank you, and thank you for being here, and thank you guys all for watching, and we'll see you next week on Crime Time.